co-ops can contribute to a fairer society in a couple of ways. It sort of goes back to there's an economic thing where you can just get a better deal working together in a democratic way through a cooperative than you might be able to otherwise, like the Stocksy example. Mm-hmm. So there's an economic element. And I think with that, it can complement other things. So it's not either or that we're just going to have co-ops and nothing else. If, mm. if you think that the tax system needs reform or that things can be done through tax, like that still stands. Um, but alongside that, co-ops can actually provide you a means to do, I guess, a fairer distribution of wealth and opportunity even before the tax system kicks in and maybe redistributes some opportunities and wealth in society. Welcome to Justice Matters, the podcast inspiring a world where everyone belongs. I'm your host, Tim Buxton. Hey there, guys. It's Tim here with Justice Matters, and I got off a Zoom conversation with Anthony Taylor. Now, he is the research and policy advisor for the Business Council of Corporates and Mutuals. Now, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but in short, we just had a great conversation about business and justice and the role that cooperatives um, play in that. Now, co-ops, you've probably heard of food co-ops, mutuals, banks, all those kinds of stuff. We get into the nitty gritty of that. But what I love about Anthony is, is his passion to see society mutually flourishing and even in his role of providing policy advice in governments and advice to businesses and, and, and different groups and small businesses and charities and organizations out there trying to make a difference in the world he's just got such a passion to see equality in our world and um, people flourishing and uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation I geeked out a little bit on it and really enjoyed just chatting with him and I think it really brings a good balance to some of the other subjects we've covered which have been more along the lines of social enterprise whereas this has got a bit more of a business flavor so if that's your thing then uh, I know you're going to enjoy it Anyways, thanks so much for listening in, guys. I hope you enjoy this episode with Anthony Taylor. Mate, just uh, doing some prep for our chat, I was just, uh, I was pretty, um, pretty impressed by your your accomplishments and achievements. I mean, you're you're a lawyer, um, and obviously have passions in arts and and law um, in your um time in in university but uh, for someone who's a lawyer i'm pretty impressed that you've kind of not decided to climb the corporate ladder and and essentially um go down that path but you've really chosen a path that engages your your passion for law um to see businesses that um engage in in basically mutual flourishing really and um what could you just like give us a bit of a a bit of a snapshot of of why like why why did you take that trajectory in life were there any inspiring moments um because we're going to talk a bit about specifically a bit about co-ops and and how they can really be a force for good in society and addressing i think justice and inequality but um but yeah let's start maybe back at at, at those early formative times for you that kind of made a a, a law grad go down that path yeah, so um, I am a lawyer, but I feel like I haven't I haven't practiced, and I guess that's part of what you're getting at, Tim, is um, where I ended up with not practicing and doing something slightly different. Um, I guess I was always an unwilling law student, so it's sort of making out like this is a, a very noble thing I did. Maybe that's you know not not the whole story, but I, I guess I was when I was going through law school. I was kind of thinking about you know, what would I do with this or what would be interesting to do with um, some legal knowledge? And one of the things I was doing while I was studying one of my part-time jobs was at the student union uh, cafe, which was run as a collective. And I guess that's where I kind of, it wasn't run, it wasn't a co-op strictly, but it kind of had some of the similar ideas. So Mm. I started thinking, oh, you can actually do things like you could support social enterprise or you could support cooperatives. And people, you know, that's something you can do if you have some legal knowledge. So I guess that that was a little seed that kind of happened while I was in uni and I was lucky enough to end up uh, in a role where that's that's basically what I'm, I'm doing now, uh, which is pretty cool. 
So, um, you yeah. work for um, BCCM, which stands for business. I, I'll let, I'm just going to let see if you can get through okay. it. Too, I'm going to say I'm going to. I've had lots of practice. You have lots it, of. <laughs> it, it is a very. It is a difficult one. It's. The, I'm going to. I'm going to see if I can get this. All right. <laughs> business. Now, the reason I may know this is because you came as a guest uh, lecturer uh, at um, University QUT where I'm studying, and um, you presented on this stuff. So, but business council for cooperatives and mutuals. How how did that go? Got it. Awesome. Yeah. I, I won't admit. I won't admit that I wasn't. I was slightly cheating, but. <clears throat> But uh, anyways, um, so you're a research policy advisor for them now. Maybe give us a bit of a snapshot of, of, of now how you're using, obviously, your, your legal skills and, and, and what you are for, for the work that they do and maybe ex- you know, explain a bit about who BCCM is. So the BCCM is the national peak body representative body for cooperatives and mutuals in Australia. And so with my role as the policy and research advisor, um, part of our job as the peak body is advocacy, advocating to government and to anyone about how the environment can be better for co-ops to operate in. So that's, that's probably the area where the legal background is helpful because a lot of that is looking at things like regulation, legislation, and saying how it could be improved for, for cooperatives and mutuals in Australia. But um, we do a lot of other stuff as well at the, the Business Council. We support our members to network and we also develop a lot of educational resources and have a focus on, I guess, general information and ed- education for people, for co-ops, but also for the community. Mm. So if there's a group out in the community that wants to find out about co-ops, we maintain lots of free resources on our website about that. And so... A big part of my role is in advocacy, but it's a bit of everything else that, that we do as well, which is things like that, talking to, as you were saying, I came and had a chat yeah. to, to your class, of just a general chat about co-ops the other week. Um, that's part of our role as well. And, and that's a really fun part of the role is just getting to have a chat to people about co-ops. Yeah. So um, maybe... Maybe let's talk about what what are co-ops because you know I, I, my first interaction with them I, w- I wouldn't say first but uh, one of one that kind of springs to mind for me is when I was back in the USA and I joined REI which is a you know like an outdoor um, um, retail kind of giant you could say and they sell all kinds of, of, of um, outdoor equipment and you had to join the membership to, you know, um, with the membership fee to join it. But um, a lot of people may, you know, interact with them with food co-ops, you know, you at your farmer's markets or, or some kind of um, ways, but there's just such a diverse uh, array of them that can be really surprising. Um, maybe, yeah, and we've talked a lot about social enterprises on this podcast because, you know, the, in the not-for-profit charity space, they're, they're really an important component of really making a social impact. But I really don't, you know, want co-ops to be overlooked even in, in the whole realm of having a significant social impact. So maybe dive in to give listeners a bit more of a, an explanation Um yeah, just a brief explanation of what co-ops are and, and what makes them unique. And um, yeah, it'd be great. Sure. Um, so a co-op is a member-owned business. That's the basic um, concept. And then who, who could be a member of a co-op? It's, it could be consumers. It could be producers or that, that's another way of saying businesses. It could be a group of workers or it could be a community of interest. Uh, this is still pretty abstract, so I'll give some examples of this. And mm. um, one example that you just mentioned is REI um, in the US, the, the hard, um, outdoors co-op. So that's an example of a consumer co-op. So your ownership is as a consumer. If you want to go and shop there, you need to become a member and you, you stay a member and have an ownership stake in that business because you shop there. 
that's a consumer co-op. Another example of that is a mutual bank or a credit union like Bank Australia. If you sign up and open an account with Bank Australia, you've actually become a member um, because you're a customer and you're um, as a member, you're a part owner and have a say in that, that cooperative financial institution or credit union. So that, that's consumer ownership, um, one type of co-op. But you can have businesses coming together or producers coming together to form a co-op. And a typical version of that is a farmer's co-op like Norco, where farmers build their own processing plant rather than relying on someone else. Or often when those co-ops start, there just wasn't anyone else to do it. So the farmers got together and did it in that local community. And then you can have worker co-ops. Some people might have heard of worker co-ops. You can run a, any, any business. You could set up a cafe and run it as a worker co-op where all the staff are part owners. Mm. And then com a community of interest, um, a typical sort of place where that comes up is something like community of community energy, where maybe in a local region you want to build a, a solar power plant and anyone who's kind of supportive of it could invest some money in the co-op and stay involved in that way and they have an interest in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And then it can get more complicated because you can have a thing called multi-stakeholder where you start mixing these. It's not so common, but you could start having like a co-op that was um, farmers and workers together or something. Um, yeah. And we're also seeing now things like platform co-ops where it's going into the digital um, age. Yeah. And you have something like Stocksy, which is a stock image um platform where you can buy stock images as a customer which is owned by the photographers right it's owned by the photographers and also the people who work for stocksy to run the site so the the workers in the business as well that's a multi-stakeholder example and it's digital it just runs an online marketing platform for those yeah. stock photographers and why like why do you bother having this type of ownership which is a bit different to what we're used to in business which is investors or a entrepreneur owning something mm -hmm. by themselves or in a small group um, it's to give benefits to those people um, to share some benefits as customers or as farmers or whatever so um, if we took that example i was just talking about stocksy why did they set up a co-op what was it was because they weren't getting a good deal from the existing stock image um, marketing sites mm. um, I can't remember the name of the big the big firms in that that market, but they weren't getting a good deal. The cut that they got as the people actually creating the artwork was pretty small. Right. They set up their own one and they can share the benefits when they get it out to someone who buys the stock image. Much more of the benefit goes back to those people. And they share it in a way that's fair between between them as well. They work out a way that they think is fair. Yeah, I mean it kind of it kind of makes you you think of the the businesses or the the workers that that kind of uh, are just employees for someone who owns the company and just reaps all the profits essentially. And and if you're smart enough or or are business savvy enough to be able to to you know set it set it all up yourself, and obviously there's great investment and entrepreneurs take great risks and 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 whatnot uh, to to get to that place but it it does then create a, a greater sense of shared of shared um sh shared value in in the wealth and the work um that 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 is produced um from that sense and and maybe we could go a bit dig a dip deeper into why that actually you know creates a greater sense of equality and justice in society because I, I i noted when when you know um, you were filling out the the form that you you, you mentioned Margaret Thatcher and, and her kind of quote that there is no such thing as society and that that kind of really rubbed you on the rubbed you a bit wrong and maybe I just want to push in there a little bit like how is how is what you're saying in this idea of of cooperatives really um, a force for bringing equality and maybe in an, in an unjust economy? Yeah, so I think. Not, we shouldn't be too utopian about cops. They're not going to solve everything. But with that, with that quote, which um, she may or may not have actually said, but that sort of line of thinking, I think, has 
something like COVID has shown us, right, mm. that it, we do live in a society. Um, we do need coordinated action between, and we rely on coordinated action, like by our governments as well to do things. Um, it's, it, it does like, it's just reality. Mm. And there's other ways that people can do this as well through thing, not just co-ops, but through local not-for-profit organizations and, um, you know, all sorts of things, but co-ops are part of that spectrum of things where a group of people can get together and coordinate um, to do something they couldn't do by themselves. And I think that idea um, is, well, it's true and really important and it just sort of goes against the grain of, of that line of thinking that maybe was prevalent um, mm. around that year in the, the 80s and onwards for a while. So I think... Um, Co-ops can contribute to a fairer society in a couple of ways. Uh, it sort of goes back to there's an economic thing where you can just get a better deal working together in a democratic way through a, a cooperative than you might be able to otherwise, like the Stocksy example. Mm -hmm. So there's an economic element. And I think with that, it can complement other things. So it's not either or that we're just going to have co-ops and nothing else. If, mm. if you think that the tax system needs reform or that things can be done through tax, like that still stands. Um, but alongside that, co-ops can actually provide you a means to do, I guess, a fairer distribution of wealth and opportunity even before the tax system kicks in and maybe redistributes some opportunities and wealth in society, just right. as, as an example. So it could, it could complement other things that people want to do to have a better society, I think. And another thing it does is co-ops are democratic. They're, they're one member, one vote. That's that's a um, okay. really strong principle of co-ops. Um, so I think it encourages participation as well. There's a sort of ci civic participation element to co-ops where people, which is the same, I think, as yeah, your local sports club or lots of other organisations as well that are, democratically run where people can get experience right um, participating in a management committee or they can mm. learn new skills there's an education and um i guess the language now sometimes is capacity building mm. here maybe in um, well there's shared wisdom right when everybody suddenly has uh, equal input or or the ability to make an input on decisions that are made big because one, they're in the community, they're, they're, they're might be far more attuned to how the decisions or the impacts that a business is making will have on, on, on that community that they're in. Um, and there's so much more that they could also contribute to, to making the, 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 the co-op run more effectively and efficiently as well, right? Absolutely. That's a really good point, Tim. I think there's an empowerment element and if you thought of, maybe a, a marginalised community, a co-op could be a better way for them to empower themselves rather than um, having a top-down approach. Or yeah, some, someone at the top, the or owner or the board or someone far disconnected making all the decisions, which tend to be in a very maybe more capitalistic sense concerned mostly about bottom dollar, right, profit. Yeah, so I think with a co-op, because the purpose is different, you're trying to deliver benefits to men. It's still a business. You still need to, like not-for-profits as well, you still sure. need to be sustainable. It's kind of my rub look. against that name, not-for-profit. It's like, it's hang not, on. Like, people get the wrong idea, don't they? Yeah. Well, it's not that we want to make a loss. It's not like we're for loss. <laughs> we, we, Yeah. But, yeah, we're yeah. not. Our, our, our purpose is social impact, not, not, uh, not um, yeah making some kind of, um, yeah, uh, yeah so share something. price hike or whatever. I didn't make this up. I think um, my boss, the CEO of the council, likes this. Um, I'll attribute it to her. Um, Melina says um, co-ops make money to do things rather than doing things to make money, which is the same as a lot of um, other purpose-led organisations, right, that you need to find a way to be sustainable financially. But it's yes. really for this this core purpose that you have, which is around um, benefits to members. And in I didn't get to with the talking about what are co-ops. Mm. They're basically member-owned businesses, but there is an international definition of co-ops. The co-op movement is a global movement where 
Um, it's a bit like social enterprise more broadly where people, you know, discuss what's the def- what is what is this? And mm. it's an ongoing discussion. But there is a definition that the co-op movement agrees on globally that basically encapsulates what I was saying about member ownership and democratic control. And we have principles as well. And it's all designed to focus co-ops on that, that purpose of delivering. Um, econ- it's often an economic benefit, but it also acknowledges it can be social and cultural benefits and aspirations that the members have as well are an important part of what co-ops are formed and exist to do. Yeah. But that, and even as you talk about that economic benefit isn't, is a shared mutual flourishing economic benefit, which to me, it seems to be the real key component. It's not Jeff Bezos making billions off of Amazon, you know, and, and, and the result of, you know, you know, employees or working for $7 an hour in some Measure, you know, you know what I mean. Like that, that, that idea of economic benefit and flourishing is it. You can actually do this where everybody flourishes and in everybody benefits in that sense, in a more just sense, a just way, right? Yeah, and the, I think the interesting part of it is that, and it went back to I think you were saying, you know, if a business is set up in another way, probably the person who found it has taken on a lot of risk. So in a co-op, you're kind of asking for people to spread that risk and take on some of the Mm. responsibility as well. That's the flip side of it where, um, yeah, we're not going to wait for Jeff Bezos, but everyone's going to have to um, maybe wear a little risk if they want to do it this other way. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. That's where the rubber hits the road, I think. That's Um, where not everything necessarily is going to be a co-op because, yeah, you, you might not just, you might not be able to pull it together that way. Yeah, exactly. Case. There's horses for courses. Some people just are quite content to not have to take any risk and just be paid a, a wage and, and come and go and punch their time card in. And, and that's, that's good. But, uh, um, you, you know, just getting back to a bit more of your work, um, why, why is it so important? You know, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm nailing down in on this kind of, this need for economic justice and how co-ops can be a way for ensuring that there is um, um, where um, there, there isn't such an, an economic oppression on those who are already, you know, um, marginalised in society. Um, and, you know, we think of how it doesn't even feel like governments run the world anymore. It's these large corporations that run the world you know these large tech firms now it is and and in the past it might have been oil companies and and we're seeing a shift in 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 where the power lies in society um why is it why is it so important that your work or in your work where it kind of addresses the systemic nature of you know the business realm and policies being made, and you're as you, as you say, you're an advocate. You speak in parliament. You talk about these things. Um, um, how how is that, and why is that just so important in in creating a just society? Well, I guess one of the issues that the business council ad- exists to address is probably just the basic awareness about co-ops as part of the economic landscape that already exists and already have an impact, Mm. especially in some certain sectors like agriculture and insurance. And um, just as an example, I think eight in 10 Australians are a member of a co-op or a mutual. A Mm. lot of that is through things like if you're part of a mutual bank or credit union or a mutual health insurer, but you probably don't know it. And a little bit of that is on the sector. And that's kind of why the business council is there is to try and rectify that where collective body of the sector saying you know we need to actually get out there and let people know this is a yeah it's already a good sector to build on but also that um getting probably more to your question is around you know why like why does it matter in the first place yeah which is, why, why um that co-ops and mutuals can actually shift the power in in markets in in favor of consumers in favor of farmers they can actually shape markets so that there are the way that people can get a better deal in the economy, basically, mm. especially if they go to a, a significant scale and have market share. But I think um, 
the other side of it, which goes to that more civil society part of it, I think is the capacity building, the, the chance for people to participate in democratic forums that are outside the traditional political democracy. Mm-hmm. And I would say that I think co-ops and mutuals complement that. So we don't have to rely just on having um, the right representatives in parliament. We can also have build economic democracy. I love that, that economic democracy. You know, I see, you know, I work with a lot of people that do incredible work in, in, in poor countries to try, you know, there's organizations like Kiva that offer micro loans and, and honestly, economic empowerment, especially of marginalized women uh, in particular, who are quite often not enabled to really get into um, business ownership in certain certain countries and, and, and parts of the world where it's, where, you know, there's women's rights and equality just aren't recognized the same as here in Australia or the West. Um, but economic power empowerment is such a key, key um, component really of alleviating po- poverty and, 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 and I guess, as you're saying that, that, capacity building and saying hey look not every everyone is going to be able to be an entrepreneur and just learn it go to you know get do a little business course and run their own business effectively and and make it right like you know we even see here in australia where there's so much support for small businesses you know for however many small businesses that start there's x amount you know a high percentage that just can't make it you know they just don't have that resiliency to to push through but what you're saying is this model actually eliminates maybe a lot of the risk and ensures that that economic empowerment um, can is is given back to the the people in in a way that could re- especially those that really wouldn't have the ability to to really make it um, can. Absolutely, and I think small business is even a good example. Small businesses can join together in co-ops and. Uh it can help them reduce some of those stresses, I guess, that is really hard on if you're a single entrepreneur or, you know, startup, someone yeah. running a startup and at least you can share some of the costs or some of the risk of doing that. Even that in itself is a good example of where <laughs> you could be uh, cooperating to um, see more of these small businesses long lasting. Yeah. Is there is there any particular co-op that's like, maybe one of the most interesting or maybe the most exciting or something, something maybe you've been involved with that you're, you're passionate about. Um, I'd love to love to hear a good example from you. Yeah. Um, well, it's tough. I'll, I'll probably cheat and go into a couple if that's right. Tim. Yeah. Take a couple. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I really wanted to share um, with people one called Silk Supporting Independent Living Cooperative, mm. which is a co-op started up about five years ago. Um, in the specialist disability accommodation um, industry. So I think the NDIS is a good example where co-ops could really help because the NDIS has been set up with this idea of empowering individuals, more choice and control for individuals Mm. with a disability. Um, But to really realise that, I think it needs to be coordinated by those people so they can get more out of their budgets and really exercise control because... If it's just left to a, a totally free market situation without a diversity of providers, maybe without some coordination by consumers and um, some leverage for consumers, I just don't see that that goal will be met. So this co-op is one example where that's that's starting to happen, where um, the co-op is actually a co-op of co-ops and the, the individual co-ops are um, small specialist houses that have been set up by parents um, um, with children with or um, guardians for people with disability. Mm. And by joining the co-op, they, all these individual houses get the economy of scale. They can spread costs. Right. And suddenly the budget that you're getting through NDS can go a lot further and you can do a lot more with it and get really good outcomes. So I think, you know, it just seems like a no-brainer and those guys are actually doing it though. So Really? Check them out. Um, Silk and S I L C is yeah. the acronym there. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, I mean, 
but this this probably shows the diversity of of co-ops and that can really apply to any any group that wants to use it is one that I had a little role in I can't can't claim too much um, with setting up was the limestone coast fishermen's co-op yeah which was a new co-op of lobster fishermen um, and okay lobster fishers in um, South Australia who wanted to they'd seen there's another really successful lobster co-op in WA the Geraldton fishermen's co-op Mm-hmm. They felt like they weren't getting a good deal from um, foreign-owned processes in their right, region, and right. could sort of see writing on the wall, the wall with that, where, you know, where things were going. So they set up their co-op and started processing uh, themselves and trying to get a better deal. And so, you know, they're not, um, I guess, lobster fishermen. Maybe you know, it's quite different to dis- people with disability and the NDIS, but there's a similar logic and. Um, I just that I just really enjoyed working with them. They were just they really got the ethos, I think, of cooperatives, and that's that's always great. Um, and they're so actually you got some, some lobster fishermen with some seats on now, right? Like, <laughs> uh, not maybe not necessarily, yeah, well, but I think that they, highlights. They, um, they, well, it's interesting that um, maybe if um, COVID hadn't hit, that might have been the case, but. Um, they set it up just before COVID, but they they're still going. They managed to get through that because that obviously has had a lot of impact on trade. Oh yeah, um, which is I important for the lobster, lobster industry. But they're actually featured in a um, documentary that was on ABC called Fight Back Farmers. Mm. Oh, that's still up on iView. Um, okay, Fight Back Farmers, check that out. And, and it's got a couple other co-ops, um, farming co-ops as well. Um, so yeah, check it out. Uh, look, I could go on, um, mm. yeah, heaps of co-ops. I mean, maybe just one last one quickly would be there's a recent community buyout in suburban Melbourne in Montmorency. Okay. So a group there got together and there was an ch- old church that wasn't being used that was going to be sold off to developers and the community got together, formed a co-op to buy the land and try and find, you know, find some community uses for it. Mm. So we're seeing a lot of that now, um, and that's a really, you know, great story when a community can do that through a co-op. Wow. I mean, that's, I mean, there's just so, like you said, there's just, it can almost apply, it can apply to any industry really, um, um, as you highlighted with Stocksy, I think it was. Yep. Um, I keep thinking of iStock, which might be one of the, 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 the big companies I-Stock. that that yeah. that probably it was exploiting. <laughs> um photographers and artists and speaking of uh, art um on an on a completely different tangent you know you you um you you caught the artist yourself is that correct or, or you just like to tinkle around with the drums and and guitar and uh, i know a little bit of i wouldn't say i'm an artist i did i studied um indonesian um but I studied Indonesian language and also Indonesian literature at uni. That was the other You're thing. You're kidding. Well, well, here's something fun fact for you. I was born in Indonesia. So, um, oh, but I can't, I was born in Bandung. There you um, go. So just outside of Jakarta there, you would know. Um, don't speak a lick of Bah- Bahasa, right? And mm-hmm. I'm not, um, uh, I was, I was a wee one when my parents came back, um, to Australia but um, but I do have like a lot of, you know, um, photos and and all the little trinkets are around the house, um, at my parents' house of of Indonesia. But uh, so you can speak some fluent Indonesian. Uh, I'm pretty rusty now, uh, Tim. But yeah, I did learn Indonesian, and I, you know, if I had a couple of weeks to warm up, I. I could say I was proficient, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. G- give us, uh, can you give us something? Apa kabar? Apa kabar. Is that like, That's uh, how are you? How are you? Awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It's always, um, and it's, you know, obviously Indonesia is a good new neighbor. Have you seen any cool co ops um, in Indonesia? Have, have you spent some time up there and, and, and learned a thing from other parts of the world? Yeah. So, there is a big co-op movement in Indonesia. Like um, they have a co-op department. So it's like really a big, it's a big thing in Indonesia. I think when you look at post-colonial countries have an interesting relationship with co-ops because a lot of the time 
um, and not only post-colonial countries, but the relationship with government and co-ops there is a bit more top-down or sometimes there's a legacy of that um, mm. where the government sort of maybe at one point set up co-ops for people. Mm. Um, so sometimes they have a legacy sector like that that they're kind of dealing with. But, yeah, they have a massive co-op sector there. They Like Australia, there's a massive credit union or mutual banking sector. It's That's really important. Um, but, yeah, Indonesia, um, probably if I wasn't doing co-op stuff, I'd be trying to do something to do with Indonesia. It's an amazing country, I guess. Um, you know, it's so many islands and so many languages. Like it's, mm. it really, it's a really diverse nation. It's sort of amazing and it's had its struggles with that. Um, but being brought together as a nation uh, is quite amazing in a way. Um, so it's, it's more than just Bali. There's a, a lot um, right, going yeah. on. Um, so that, that would be, I'd say, is go if you go to Bali, also go pick another island and check it out. Yeah. Java, um, Sumatra. Go to Java or any, anywhere. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, yeah, Java's got some really amazing places to visit. Um, Jogjakarta, for example. Mm. Yeah. Oh, man, that's awesome. And um, well, I think we've kind of um, had a really good yarn and a good yak. What would, what would to inspire people to maybe look, look into it a bit more? What, you know, what's your final pitch or what's your final, um, you know, um, thing you'd like to share with our, our listeners today? Uh, I guess I have to give a plug for the BCCM website, which is bccm.coop or .coop. That's another thing. Co-ops have a, their own domain. Oh, yeah. You can be a dot. If you're a former co-op, you, could get to, you can get a .coop um, website. Um, yeah, check out our website. There's lots of information on there. I'm, I'm happy my details are somewhere on the website so people can uh, get in contact with me if they're, they're doing some sort of social enterprise or social thing that might be a co-op. I'm always happy to have a chat. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Yeah, I think I mentioned this in the class when I was speaking to you, Tim. Like if people want a more like a more deeper dive into co-ops or sort of the history and the philosophy around them, um, I'd recommend looking up Nathan Schneider, who's a US journalist who writes about co-ops and wrote a book called, um, I'm going to forget the name now, uh, e Everything for Everyone that talks mm. about co-ops. And it kind of captures this thing about co-ops that um, they're very, like they apply to everything. Then they're kind of a mundane thing in a way, like they're just businesses that provide goods and services to people. But they've also kind of got this edge of, being quite radical at the same time. And I think he kind of has a way of capturing that nicely. I love that. So yeah, it it's a great point to finish on that. It, it, you know, this is just everyday life. It's what we do, right? We, we wake up, we, we do business, we might make things, we um, might provide a service or what it, whatever that might be. This is everyday life, but um, in a way, restoring it, in and redeeming maybe some of the more um, elements to where people can exploit and take advantage of that and 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 making sure that um, it's done which seems radical right it seems radical that the steps we have to take to make sure that we live in a fair society and that uh, exploitation and and greed doesn't doesn't um, bleed into to our lives in ways it doesn't need to so hats off for all the great work that you do the behind the scenes work of research of policy of of sharing and creating awareness um really appreciate what you're doing and the contributing contribution you're making um and the ways you share that so freely with others um really appreciate it um anthony and coming on and sharing about it thanks tim thanks for having me Thanks for listening to this episode of Justice Matters. I'd also like to shout out to the Patreon community that financially supports this podcast. Guys, thank you so much for your support. And you can join them simply by going to patreon.com forward slash justice matters, where a simple donation of $5 a month, you can become part of the Patreon community and get access to behind the scenes content 
and extras that I share just with you. And lastly, there is another really important way that you can help support the podcast, and that's simply by rating it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, maybe by subscribing on YouTube. Yes, we are a video podcast as well. Guys, thank you so much for listening in to this episode Justice Matters. Please come again soon. I can't wait to share more episodes with you. Thank you so much. I'm your host, Tim Buxton. Thanks for listening.